At the height of his literary career in the 1850s, Charles Dickens was by far the most popular novelist in the English-speaking world. Among his great masterpieces were David Copperfield, A Tale of Two Cities, and Great Expectations. Dickens was born in 1812 during the time of the Napoleonic Wars, and he died in 1870, a few years after the conclusion of the Civil War in America. In his writings, Dickens often reflected the hearty and genial England of an earlier period. A spirited representative of that England, seen here giving a toast, was the eloquent Pickwick, as Dickens called his main character in the Pickwick Papers, his first major literary success. Dickens could also represent the coarser and crueler sides of life with the same warmth and enthusiasm with which he portrayed Pickwick. In this scene from Oliver Twist, the artful dodger is seen, to Oliver's amazement, stealing a handkerchief from a gentleman's pocket. While Dickens relished the England of the past, he was also deeply concerned with such issues of his own time as the prison system, the poor, and the welfare and education of children. The period in which Dickens lived was one of enormous change in England. When it was completed in 1851, the Crystal Palace, built chiefly of iron and glass, stood as a symbol not only of the new industrial technology, but also of the artistic tastes of the time. In 1851, Queen Victoria, then in the 30th year of her 63-year reign, opened the Great Exhibition in London at the Crystal Palace. The Victorian period, as it has come to be known, was the period in which Dickens spent the mature years of his life. The driving force of the period was the industrial technology which had been developing in England since the middle of the 18th century. Wider and wider application was being made of the techniques of mass production. The railroads, from their introduction in the 1820s, revolutionized transportation and travel. A passion for building was a leading feature of the period which placed a high value on industriousness. The pace of life in many parts of England was being accelerated by the new devotion to work. If the period found its purpose in work, the poor were its outstanding problem. To even the casual observer, the poor made up a disturbingly large proportion of those living in the swelling cities. The wretched slums, polluted air and blackened countryside being created as by-products of the Industrial Revolution formed another problem. It was hardly surprising that Dickens was fond of an earlier England, confronted, as he often was, by tall chimneys out of which interminable serpents of smoke trailed themselves and never got uncoiled. Large areas of England remained untouched by this blight, however. Most Englishmen still were born and lived in the quiet isolation of small villages. Rural England remained much as it had been for centuries, and farming was an activity which still occupied a large proportion of the population. In the country, the aristocracy and the gentry continued to hold strong, if slightly diminished, positions in English life. Fox hunting was a favourite sport of those accustomed to having ample time for leisure. With its open fields, the country offered a marked contrast to the city. But even cities were not as large in Dickens' time as they were later to become. The traveller approaching London in a coach could see in the distance the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral at the centre of the city as he passed through the green and attractive outskirts of London. London, which had a population of over two million by 1845, was the commercial and cultural centre of England. The visitor, or the resident for that matter, could not help being impressed by London's broad streets or the grandeur of the buildings and architecture of such places as the Quadrant.
The London to which Dickens came at the age of ten was a place filled with activity, excitement and variety. In his writings, Dickens came to make good use of this rich setting. The heart of the city was the Thames, which wound its way as a highway for commerce through London. Here, as Dickens himself described it, were tiers upon tiers of vessels, scores of masts, labyrinths of tackle, idle sails, splashing oars, gliding rowboats, lumbering barges, sunken piles, all jumbled up together any summer morning. London was also the political capital of Great Britain. It was first as a reporter in the courts and later as a parliamentary reporter that Dickens gained first-hand knowledge of the workings of English law and politics. Part of his job as a newspaper reporter was to record the speeches delivered in Parliament. Writing later of his patience in recording long and frequently barren speeches, Dickens declared, I must have borne the House of Commons like a man, and have yielded no weakness but slumber in the House of Lords. As a successful reporter, Dickens expanded the scope of his writings by contributing sketches of London social life to magazines. His first book, a collection of these short pieces, appeared in 1836, and it was entitled Sketches by Boz, Boz being a pseudonym that Dickens adopted. The book contained illustrations by George Cruikshank, who also did this drawing of Dickens at the outset of his literary career. Life had not always been so promising for Dickens. As a boy of twelve, he had been sent out to work in a blacking warehouse in London. No words can express the secret agony of my soul as I sunk into this companionship, wrote Dickens in David Copperfield of this episode, which he kept secret until the later years of his life. Only a few days after he started working at the blacking warehouse, Dickens' father was sent to the Marshalsea, a prison for debtors in London. It was part of English law at the time that debtors could be arrested and held in prison until their debts were paid. The Marshalsea, which is seen here, became the setting for Little Dorrit, a novel in which Dickens tried to show the inhumanity of the practice of imprisonment for debt. Dickens had a lasting preoccupation with prisons. Great Expectations and Barnaby Rudge both have prison scenes, and even Pickwick serves his own delightful turn in a debtor's prison. A Tale of Two Cities opens in a royalist prison and ends in a revolutionary one. One of Dickens' most memorable prison scenes occurs at the end of Oliver Twist. In the condemned cell, the lifelong criminal Fagan awaits public hanging a practice not abolished in England until 1868. Throughout his life, Dickens argued for the abolition of capital punishment and for the reform of the prison system. Having sat through the debates leading to the new Poor Law of 1834 as a parliamentary reporter, Dickens was well aware of the connection between crime and poverty and he did not fail to see the resemblance between prisons and the overcrowded quarters inhabited by the poor. The abuse of children under the poor laws drew Dickens' sharpest indignation. His compassion for children consigned to a workhouse with its customary diet of gruel is revealed in the scene from Oliver Twist where Oliver asks the master ladling out the gruel for more. What? said the master at length in a faint voice. Please, sir, replied Oliver, I want some more. The master aimed a blow at Oliver's head with a ladle, pinioned him in his arms, and shrieked aloud for the beadle. In the preface to one of his last novels, Our Mutual Friend, Dickens wrote, But that my view of the poor law may not be mistaken or misrepresented, I will state it. I believe there has been in England since the days of the Stuarts no law so often infamously administered, no law so often openly violated, 
no law habitually so ill-supervised. A report made by a commission of inquiry into the employment of children in 1842 described children working in coal pits as chained, belted, harnessed like dogs in a go-kart, dragging their heavy loads behind them. The initiation of a series of reforms starting in 1842 brought about fairly rapid improvements in the treatment and welfare of children. A wider interest was being taken in education at all levels. The lower classes, which previously had been given little or no education, were beginning to send their children to rag schools like this one, where although conditions were often bad, the rudiments of an education could be obtained. In novels such as David Copperfield, Nicholas Nickleby and Hard Times, Dickens pictured the school life of students who came largely from middle-class families. As it became more apparent that education was a means to advancement, an education became a more important and serious matter. Commenting on the learned Mr. MacChokum child, who tries to force-feed the students of Coketown with facts, Dickens wrote in Hard Times, If only he had learned a little less, how infinitely better he might have taught much more. The highest academic standards were maintained by schools such as Eton and Harrow, where the upper classes had traditionally sent their sons. It was to Eton that Dickens, who himself had attended the less prestigious Wellington House Academy in London, chose to send his own son. Students who went to the better schools were usually expected to go on to the colleges at Oxford and Cambridge, but study played only part of university life for the young undergraduate. Coming down from Oxford or Cambridge, the young gentleman might try to make his way in the fashionable world of London society. A ball was one of the formal occasions which the young gentleman would either be expected to attend or, in the case of the aspiring gentleman, try to secure an invitation to. Compared with earlier times, there was an increased mobility in English social life during the Victorian period, and among the ingredients contributing to social position were family, wealth and talent. Another setting for social life in London were the art galleries, which were as likely to be a favourite haunt of those wishing to be seen as of those interested in the arts. For the established gentlemen seeking a moment of peace, there were those traditional institutions, the gentlemen's clubs. Here membership was usually selective, and the activities within might range from a temperate lunch to an intemperate supper. Horse racing was a popular sport in Dickens' time. At the racecourse, the latest fashions were often in competition with the horses and gambling for the centre of attention. While the Victorians insisted on high moral standards, these standards did not prevent gambling from being a popular diversion, and for some, a road to ruin. Sudden changes in personal fortunes were common during this time, and the subject of family continuity, a subject that Dickens explored in his novel Dombey and Son, was a matter of great concern. This painting, finished in 1862, was called The Last Day in the Old Home, and it shows the woman of the family handing over the keys of the family home to an estate agent. The home, which may have been in the family for generations, is being sold to pay off the gambling debts of the heir. Uh, notice the picture of the racehorse on the floor. Even worse, the heir, with one arm around his son and the other raising a glass of champagne, is already passing on his bad habits to his son. One practice that was responsible for the sudden changes in wealth during Dickens' time was speculation. Those speculating in railroad shares in particular might become rich or be forced into bankruptcy overnight. Of those who came to wealth or political power by means of speculation, Dickens complained, Where does he come from? Shares. 
Where is he going to? Shares. What are his tastes? Shares. Has he any principles? Shares. What squeezes him into Parliament? Shares. Dickens himself had become prosperous as a writer of novels which sold in the tens of thousands. But while he was prosperous and moved in fashionable and affluent circles in London, his social conscience did not diminish, and if anything, his awareness of social injustices became more acute. Household Words, the weekly journal that he started in 1850, gave Dickens a platform as a reformer. Here, week after week, social questions such as the poor laws, education, prison reform, housing, factory conditions and emigration were discussed in articles that Dickens himself edited. Dickens also took an active interest in the theatre. As a young man, he had once thought of becoming a professional actor, but instead of developing his dramatic talents on the stage, he soon displayed them in his novels. As a famous author, Dickens appeared as amateur performer in a number of plays. In 1857, he both produced and took a principal part in a play by Wilkie Collins called The Frozen Deep, a scene from which is shown here. In the same year, Dickens also gave the first of the public readings, which, during the remainder of his life, would make recurrent demands on his energy. His readings, which he also presented to American audiences in a tour of the United States in 1867, were an enormous success. Not only was Dickens a central literary figure of his day, but his readings were a great one-man show, in which he took all the parts and poured himself into each of his characters. The character of Dickens' novels readily won a place in the hearts of the readers of his day. Everyone could appreciate Scrooge of A Christmas Carol as a caricature of the all-too-common, tight-fisted businessman. And the transformation of Scrooge into a charitable soul by the Christmas spirit could be seen by the reader as Dickens himself saw it, as an affirmation of benevolence in life and the world. The Christmas spirit was the highest expression of Dickens' belief in benevolence as a social ideal. His awareness of and reaction against evil and injustice never lessened Dickens' belief in the overriding goodness of human nature. At the beginning of his literary career, in Sketches by Boz, he had written, There seems a magic in the very name of Christmas. Petty jealousies and discords are forgotten, Social feelings are awakened in bosoms to which they have long been strangers. Would that Christmas lasted the whole year through, as it ought, and that the prejudices and passions which deform our better nature were never called into action among those to whom they should ever be strangers. Right.